Effective Prayer When we pray, we should always seek to voice requests that are in harmony with God's will. Here's Gene. John ends this little epistle on the subject of prayer. And one of the things that he wants us to do is to pray in, in God's will. And so he says, this is the confidence we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears whatever we ask, that is, according to his will, we know that we have what we have asked of him. Now, how do we know when we're praying according to the will of God? Well, in some respects, that's a mystery. In other respects, it's not a mystery because God tells us in many, many respects what His will is. And so we can pray according to His will in relationship to what we know is in the Word of God. But there are many things that we face in our lives that are not spelled out in, in the Word of God. So that's a great mystery in some respects. Prayer is a great mystery. In fact, there are many mysteries in Christianity, which is the uniqueness of Christianity. Ken Boa has written a book entitled, God I Don't Understand, and he raises several questions uh, that are mysteries. For example, how can Jesus be both God and man? Try to explain that. That that Jesus was perfect God and perfect man. That's a great mystery. Here's another question. How can the Bible be both divine and human in origin? Written by man, but inspired by God. That's a great mystery. Here's another question. How can God be three persons and yet one God? Now, there are some people that use all kinds of illustrations to try to illustrate that, but you never can. I don't care what human illustration you use, it falls short of what it really means for God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit to be one, and yet three persons. Another question, how can God be sovereign and we're still free to choose? That one is one that we'll spend eternity probably trying to understand and comprehend. And we could ask this question about prayer, because prayer, too, is a mystery. How can prayer be reconciled with God's providence? Now, providence is a word that's not used in Scripture, neither is the word Trinity. But still, we have the Trinity, the truth of the Trinity, and we have the truth of God's providence. And what is God's providence? Well, let me give you several definitions. Uh, this comes from Dr. Augustine Long. Providence is that continuous agency of God by which He makes all the events of the physical and moral universe fulfill the original design by which He created it. That's God's providence. Here's a, a definition from J. Oliver Bushwell. God is not only the creator of all things, but He continuously sustains and rules all of His creation. That's God's providence. Here's what T. H. L. Parker says. The doctrine of providence tells us that the world and our lives are not ruled by chance or by fate, but by God. That's God's providence. And so we have God's providence and prayer. Now, if these definitions are biblically accurate, and I, I believe they are, how does prayer fit into God's sovereign and providential plans? In many respects, that's a mystery. Someone might argue that if God has planned everything and the plan is going to be fulfilled, why pray at all? Why pray at all? And yet God tells us to pray. 
And that's a mystery. Here's another thought. If God has planned certain things, won't they happen anyway? You know, why pray? Well, God tells us to pray. And so, the best way to answer these questions is to go uh, to the Word of God. And since we're looking at what God wrote, uh, let's notice requirements before God will respond to our prayers. Now, we've already looked at um, a first guideline. Number one, we must act according to God's will. And that's a, that's a powerful, powerful statement. But here's number two. We must be in close fellowship with God for God to answer our prayers. These are simply statements from Scripture. John 15, 7, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, whatever you want, it will be done for you. 1 John 3, 21, 22, which we've already looked at. Dear friends, if our hearts don't condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive whatever we ask from Him because we keep His commands and do what is pleasing in His sight. And so, God says clearly that if we're going to have answers to our prayers, we must be walking in close fellowship with Him. And then here's, a, here's another guideline. We must ask with pure motives. James spoke to this. He said, You ask and you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. And there he's referring to pleasures of sin. And that, that's kind of contradictory, isn't it? <laughs> I'm going to ask God to give me something so I can sin. But evidently, these believers that James wrote to were doing that. And he said, you ask and you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives. Those wrong motives are, so you may spend it on your pleasures. But here's a, a fourth guideline. I love this one, and it's very simple. We must ask. And James said right in the same context, you do not have because you do not ask. Now, these are statements that are given to us in view of the fact that prayer is related to God's providence, and yet God says there are certain things that must be true for us to experience answers to prayer. And regardless of the mysteries, God answers prayer. And there are certain guidelines where he will not answer prayer, and there are certain guidelines where he will answer prayer. And when we get into these great mysteries, we simply have to go back to the things we understand and live with those great truths that we can understand. You know, I've, I've raised a reflection and response question here, and that is, why is Nehemiah's model so significant in understanding prayer? And uh, Nehemiah's model relates to the fact that he was cupbearer to the king. He was in captivity. And about five or six hundred miles away, the walls of Jerusalem were broken down, and the Jews that were there were in great turmoil and great pain because of the enemies of Israel. And Nehemiah didn't know what to do except pray. And he gives us a beautiful model prayer. First of all, he acknowledged God's greatness. He just simply say, said, God, you're awesome. And you can do anything you want to do. Secondly, he reminded God of his promises. God, you made certain promises to my people Israel. And you said if we do certain things, you'd answer prayer, you'd deliver us. Now, God has made certain promises to us, too, as His children. So it applies to us. Nehemiah confessed his sins and the sins of his people. And we're told to confess our sins and not to be asking with wrong motives, 
And then Nehemiah was very specific in his request. He said, grant me favor with this king, Artaxerxes, that he served. Now, God answered that prayer, and I've used that, that model prayer many times, and I've seen God answer prayers. But there's still mysteries. Some of you know that at one point in my life, I had a serious bout with a very serious illness. It was known as COVID-19. And at my age, I was very vulnerable. In fact, about the second or third week I was in the hospital, my, my family gathered together at the advice of the doctor to say goodbye, that I was going home to heaven. But obviously God had other plans. <laughs> and I turned around and I was in the hospital and care centers for eight months before I was able to go home even. And I had certain things that resulted from that serious disease. And one of them has affected my legs so that I couldn't walk. Now, I've been athletic all my life, and that was a whole new experience for me. And those of you who follow my teachings and have actually come up to 1 John, the silly epistle, and the last several principles that I've done, uh, you may not have noticed, but I'm sitting down. Up to that point, I was standing up. But I'm sitting down because I can't stand up. Now, I've really prayed and I've asked God if He might heal me. And I've, uh, I've searched my heart. I've tried to practice the principles we've talked about today, that to confess sin in my life, to walk in fellowship with Him. And at this point in time, God hasn't answered that prayer. But the interesting thing is, you see, I don't really know what the will of God is about my legs. Because God never told me for sure, or any one of us, that He would heal us from physical illnesses, for sure. We have to pray if it's your will, and we don't know what the will of God is. now. Paul, you see, prayed three times that a serious thorn in the flesh would be removed from him. And God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. But the fact of the matter is, God spoke directly to Paul in ways that he doesn't speak to most of us, at least not to me. So you see, I don't know what God's will is about my legs. But I've told the Lord, Lord, if it could be your will, I'd love to walk again. It'd be a lot easier to serve you if I could walk again. But I've also told the Lord, Lord, if you want me in a wheelchair the rest of my life, I want to serve you that way. But you know, I'm not going to stop praying. I don't know what His will is. But I'll continue to pray, Lord, if it's Your will, heal me. Prayer is a great mystery. We don't understand it all. But one thing I know, we're to feel free to pray and ask God to do anything if it's His will, assuming that we're walking in His will as we know it in Scripture. So here's the principle to live by. When we pray, we should always seek to voice requests that are in harmony with God's will.